All right. Hello, everyone. So before we get started, Third Place Books would like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people past and present, and honor with gratitude the Duwamish people and the land itself. So welcome, everyone, to our virtual event space. My name is Allie. You might recognize me from our Lake Forest Park location, and I am your host for this evening. Uh, I'm so excited to be introducing three romance writers, Katie Robert, RM Virtues, and Nisha Sharma, here to discuss the highly anticipated second book of the Dark Olympus series, Electric Idol. But before we get into the good stuff, on behalf of all of us here at Third Place Books, I just want to quickly thank you all so much for tuning in. For those of you who may not know, we are an independent bookstore with three locations in the Seattle area. And as much as we miss having these events in our bookstores, it has been such a delight to expand this online program to connect readers and authors in a virtual space. So thank you all for tuning in and of course for buying books. Your support is what makes all of this possible. If you haven't gotten your hands on a copy of any of the books that come up this evening and you'd like to, I will be linking books in chat. For those of you in the Seattle area, come on in and grab a copy right off the shelf or you can place an order online and come pick them up in store. Or if you're not local or not leaving the house, we of course ship. So go ahead and follow those links in chat to our website. And while you're over on our website, I definitely encourage you to check out some of our other upcoming events. We have an exciting roster coming up in the new year, including an event or two in person, which is very exciting. If you'd like to stay in touch with our community, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's a weekly update about events, exciting releases, our online book clubs, and of course, follow us on any of the major social media platforms. We are at Third Place Books for the quickest updates and recommendations. So tonight, we are here for an hour, and towards the end, we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, which we very much hope that you do, we love hearing from you, uh, go ahead and leave those in the Q&A box, which should be on the menu uh, from either the top or bottom of your screen. It is different than the chat box, which is great for virtual applause and connecting with each other. I absolutely invite you to share where you're tuning in from this evening in chat, but when it comes time for questions, do make sure those end up in the Q&A so we can most easily find them. While you're in our chat and question spaces, I want to remind you to please lead with kindness and refrain from any inappropriate behavior or harassment. Uh, for anyone interested, there are auto-generated closed captions available from the menu at the top or bottom of the screen. Select the live transcript button to enable or disable them. And finally, should any technical issues arise, we will work as quickly as we can to resolve them. And we appreciate your patience and understanding. All right, so now it is time for all of us to settle in because without further ado, I am so pleased to welcome Katie Robert, the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of numerous contemporary romances and romantic suspense, including the Bloodline Vampire series, the Sabine Valley series, the Scandalous Scion series, and of course, the Dark Olympus series, which kicked off with Neon Gods. Uh, Entertainment Weekly calls her writing unspeakably hot and her books have sold over a million copies. The book of the evening, Electric Idols, takes us back to ultra modern, the ultra modern city of Olympus, this time for an Eros and Psyche retelling. Our next author this evening is R.M. Virtues, a mythology junkie, lover of love, and author of the Gods of Hunger series, and most recently, Sing Me to Sleep. He writes erotic romance and dark fantasy about underrepresented characters who get to live and love in a history unabridged. And our third author this evening is Nisha Sharma, author of the Singh Family Trilogy, the upcoming Dating Dr. Dill, uh, which will be launching in March, as well as the critically acclaimed YA novel, My So-Called Bollywood Life, and the follow-up Ratha and Jay's Recipe for Romance. Her writing has been praised by NPR, Cosmopolitan Magazine, Teen Vogue, BuzzFeed, Entertainment Weekly, and so many other places. Uh, so thank you all so much for being here. Um, hello from Bo uh, Boston and Philly. Hi, everyone. Um, Thank you for being here. I'm going to pass the stage to our authors. 
uh, let me know if anybody needs anything. I will be in the chat. And with that, I will say goodbye. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I am so excited to be here. So um, I'm, I, like I mentioned earlier before we got started, I have some questions and I want to like, you know, do the chat thing. So, but first I think we should do the appropriate promo thing where we talk about our books a little bit. So do your elevator pitch for either recent release or upcoming, um, please and thank you. <laughs> I hate this part, but you know, it's kind of what we're here for. <laughs> Go ahead. Right, you want to go first? Yeah, I'll go first. Um, uh, I'm not good on the spot. But uh, so uh, my most recent release was Sing Me to Sleep, which was a monster romance featuring a sleep paralysis demon and a human uh, mortal woman um, who's having trouble sleeping due to an experience that she had recently. And uh, she finally starts going to sleep. But inevitably meets uh, Atron, our sleep paralysis demon. And uh, it's a small companion novel to a larger series that's in development right now, which is the series of sacrilegious events. And that will be coming out later this year. Um, and it, it focuses on the seven deadly sins. So it's just a kind of a intro to the demon world, if you will, um, that will take place over the next seven books for now, I believe. So that's where we're at right now. Um, and then uh, my next release, which will be out in February, hopefully, is uh, the third book in the Gods of Hunger series, which is Let Me In. And that features uh, Dionysus and Athena. Um, it's uh, best friends to lovers and a whole lot of suspense and mutual pining and uh, just, uh, a lot of drama and the slowest burn I will ever write and will never do it again. So <laughs> Perfect. slow burn is always hard because I just want them like together on like the second page. <laughs> I don't understand. Is slow burn not when they hook up at 25%? Is that not how that <laughs> Wait, works? I feel like 25% is, is better than 17%. That's slower. <laughs> so uh, all right, Nisha, tell us about dating Dr. Dill. Yeah. So uh I'm really excited to be here. Um, congratulations, Katie, on Electric Idol. I'm very excited for the book. Um, um, I have like two of your books downloaded. I'm also very excited to dive into like my monster romance, like like venturing into monster romance has just started with like Morning Glory Milking Farm earlier <laughs> last year. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, it's, it's time. Um, I, I read a couple before then, but like nothing consistently, but now it's I feel like my my Kindle is is pretty much well well represented monster romance. Um, so dating Doctor Bill is not a monster romance, and <laughs> for those of you who uh, may be here from TikTok uh, and have heard me talk about mafia romance, it is also not a mafia romance. <laughs> it is usually nothing like the books that I like talk about online. Um, it's, uh, it's a rom-com and it's the first book in a trilogy that are reimaginations of Shakespeare comedies. And uh, Dating Dr. Bill specifically is Taming of the Shrew. Um, Bill in Hindi means heart. The hero's name is Sprame, which means love. And he's a cardiologist who does not believe in true love. Um, and so he, of course, meets a Taylor Swift obsessed heroine who is looking for her soulmate. And uh, both of them have to kind of pair up together to, uh, to secure like money for their individual dreams but in the process they realize that maybe they're each other's dream um so uh it's filled with tons of shenanigans and it's uh it's spicy as as the kids say and I'm very excited about it <laughs> I think we're all very excited about it um <laughs> and mine is Electric Idol which is I'm real bad at this or very good. I guess it depends on how, who, who you're talking to, but like how I've been pitching this book everywhere is that it's if a murderous feral cat, somebody's nice to them one time and he follows her home and like marries her instead of murdering her, except it's Psyche and Eros and he's not a cat. Um, but it's like, it's not inaccurate. And, and somebody the other day called him a murder kitten. And like, I can't, 
that's that's what it is now that's what he is and so it's a uh, marriage of convenience with like real marriage and like they're trying to spin this like romance of the century to like keep her safe because his mom wants her literal heart and it's just yeah it's it's really spicy and high politics shenanigans and glitz and glamour and um yeah plus size heroine who's a socialite or not sorry excuse me like an influencer type and then my again murderous hero who is not a cat but might as well be <laughs> so <laughs> Listen, I, I like it's TikTok's fault. It's TikTok's I fault know. that this is how I relate to things now. But we've all kind of done like reimagining slash retelling slash like taking the inspiration we want from like older stories and giving them a spin. What was it like about you that drew you to wanting to, I guess, put your own spin on some of these older stories slash myths slash tales? Nisha. <laughs> Mm. Um, so it's like, I'm going to try to truncate the story. Um, Shakespeare has always been an influence. Like ever since I watched the Kenneth Branagh and Emma Thompson version of Much Ado About Nothing back in the day. And I was like hooked from that moment where he like looks at her and he's like, my dear lady disdain. And I'm like, that is the hero. <laughs> And that was it for me. So Shakespeare's always been like a uh, influence in a lot of um, the art that I consume. Like I love Shakespeare retellings, reimaginations. Um, and in 2019, I had gone to the Shakespeare Library in DC. It's called the Folger Library, where you basically see all of these like folios or sheets of paper that he had written the plays on. They had the largest collection um, and they had like acquired new versions. And I was talking to one of the Shakespeare scholars there and I was like, well, you know, this is my favorite. And I'm just I like sometimes I don't understand why I'm so attracted to it. And he said, well, sometimes what Shakespeare used to do is basically shape his plays or change his plays, um, alter them to fit the audience. Um, so he do it in a way so that like what uh, whatever he would be on that night, he would like gauge the audience's reactions to like the type of jokes that would really hit. And I wanted to take some of these core concepts in his stories and basically um, alter it in a way that um, had a very similar theme to like what he was trying to convey, yet at the same time uh, resonated with my audience and with my community. And so, um, you know, there was this like idea of taking these Shakespeare plays. So then I called my editor to like pitch it to her and basically was like, what do you think? And, and I started with, hear me out. What if Shakespeare was really bad at giving like dating advice <laughs> and he was giving this dating advice to a bunch of like single South Asian women and he also happened to be an auntie <laughs> and so like thus <laughs> the trilogy was born and Tammy of the Shrew was like really anti-feminist like he basically manipulates Kate until she gives in. So my plan with the play was to completely deconstruct it, which is why it's not a retelling at all. And uh, like there's three stages of abuse, which is like he starves her, he like makes her sleep deprived, he like makes her say whatever, like he like uh, makes her like parrot whatever he's thinking. And so uh, like in Dating Dr. Dill, you will find that he's always feeding her. <laughs> The only place that she can sleep is in his bed and he's the one who has to change. So, uh, so that is, that is my approach to like Shakespeare's retelling and, and, and reimagination of the story. And what are the other two comedies that you're doing? Cause it's a trilogy, right? It is. So I'm starting on the next one. Um, I'm, I'm finishing up my next YA. Um, so, uh, that's like my mean girl redemption story, but like my, um, my next Shakespeare story is about a chef and a wedding planner, and it's much ado about nothing. And then I'm hitting Twelfth Night, and that comes out in like 2024, though. So Twelfth Night is the one that I always forget about, but I like love the most. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, RM, you're up. Um, 
So, uh, I mean, really, because I've actually kind of stocked my schedule full of retellings and reimaginings, um, it, it really all comes from the same place, which is um, taking a lot of like these places that have been represented in media, popular media as like homogenized places. In reality, they were very multicultural um, historically. And uh, taking that and just putting myself in it, putting uh, my communities in it, um, and kind of undoing a lot of the the stuff that was like you know written over or erased um from the narrative like i mean basically like it's all queer um it's all uh you know there's a lot of um, people of color there's a lot of um black main characters there's a lot of um just like you know there's still the messy relationships especially with gods of hunger like uh there's a lot of um, the characterization shifts a lot just because everybody was kind of trash in Greek mythology, you know, before. So rewriting that has been really important, but also just like the parts of them that weren't um, so bad, so much bad as uh, misinterpreted or misunderstood or, you know, in that context couldn't really work. Um, I think that it was important for me to be able to see myself because I've always been a mythology geek like I've always um, really went towards it just because it, it was like the ultimate level of escapism like you know you would kind of immerse yourself in these stories and it was a whole world like they had stories for everything like the creation stories and you know how do you make fire and how are people you know brought into the world like that was what I really loved about it was like just having such an immersive um, story and then all these little stories within that. So being able to retell the little stories while also recreating the world to fit, you know, people like me who don't see themselves everywhere, don't see themselves in a lot of places that have been, you know, exclusive, um, being able to give them this world and make it a world where they don't have to fight for a place in it um, has been really really fun but that's really what my motivation has been with all of the retellings that I've um, crafted in my head and are now waiting patiently kind of patiently uh, to be written but um, yeah it's just really about like being able to see myself in the media that I consume so much and I'm sure there are other people like me who felt the same so um, it's really for them first and foremost. So it, it's been fun to do that. Awesome. I, you know me, like I, if there's a freaking story that we can retell, I'm like, let's do it. I want, I want, I love the core stories and I love seeing like the spins that people put on them because you could have, well, I mean, you you do have 500 Hades and Persephone retellings, but each one is unique to itself because of the perspective the author's bringing in and it's just, it's my favorite thing in the entire world. Um, and that's kind of like why I gravitate towards retellings and, and I just keep doing them is because I really love that. Like, like, how can I spin this in a way that's still familiar and identifiable, but also like feels fresh, at least to me, like, and, and in the Greek, like Pantheon is just, it's all tragedy. It's all sad. It's all like, oh, that person turned into a tree. That one, you know, definitely got murdered up and now they're a constellation. And like, I just want, or I'm having a lot of fun telling stories that's like, no, like, fuck that. Justice for the people that I think were cool and like down with everybody else. Thumbs down fuck boys of Greek mythology. And, uh, you know, which <laughs> if, you're, if you're a super classical fan, probably not the books for you. But if you like like that sort of thing, like, I'll we'll hook you up. Um, so this is one of my favorite questions because I think it's so, like, I feel like when we, in our careers and like, cause we all start as readers, there are like the books that were like instrumental and influential on like, we have that for us as people, but there's also like separate books for you as like a writer that like kind of was that moment when you're like, oh my God, I didn't know we could do this. And then like influence and you can see like the fingerprints on your work or like your 
process or like whatever today Mm -hmm. and so like I want to know who that was or what projects or whatever that was for you because I just I love that I geek out over it so RM you go first this time um not to put you totally on the spot be like tell me but (laughs) you continue to (laughs) I know (laughs) but uh no um as a writer I feel like one person that like immediately comes to mind is um Maggie Steve Otter her Raven Cycle series, which was a YA series. I think that was like the first time I saw, I mean, I'm not sure, I'm sure it's not the first time it was done, but the first time that I really felt like it was um, the kind of style I was going for where they, where she kind of marries, um, you know, literary prose with kind of lyrical, um, poetic prose and, it's beautiful writing that still propels the story forward, which, you know, at that time I was kind of being led to believe that that wasn't possible. Like you either did poetry or you did literature. Like you, you couldn't tell a story and be, you know, and make it pretty at the same time in that way. And seeing her do it for uh, four books was so magical because it was still a lot of character development like the character development was really great um and amazing and the story kept going forward and there was always something to you know catch you off guard like she still did a very good job of telling a story while also being very um lyrical and and pretty about it like you really wanted to live in that world because it was literally just a little small town in virginia like it wasn't a fantasy world but it felt like one because of the way that she talked about it like she made she made a pizza restaurant seem so romantic and beautiful and you're like it's just a greasy pizza pizza restaurant like you know but because she was able to do that I felt like that's what I want to do like I want to be able to um be poetic and also tell a good story at the same time and uh, she really made me believe like, oh, okay, this is actually possible. And every, I mean, a lot of people seem to like it. So I think it, it'll work out. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the one that comes to mind first. Yeah. Those stories very much feel like old tales. Like they're mm-hmm. like very, yeah, I totally get what you're saying. All right, Nisha, tell me. <laughs> um, I think a lot of authors have had like their thumbprint on like the Nisha Sharma core story. Um, I read my first romance novel when I was like in middle school. So like my English teacher had given me like Pride and Prejudice. And then I went to like the children's book section of our library and I devoured like everything that like had like just a whiff of a romance, like just like just the air of it. And like I had made my way through all of the Nancy Drew books, all the Nancy Drew and Hardy Boy books, all of the like super mysteries with them together. I wrote, I started writing like at the time I didn't know what it was, but it was fan fiction of like Nancy Drew and Hardy Boys like solving crimes together. And so like that was like the strong willed like professional heroine who like went out and like did a thing that still finds its way into my books. Then, like, the summer before, like, my eighth grade, I, like, wandered into the adult section, and, like, I remember Chase Susco's mom was the librarian at the time, and he was in my class, and I was, like, I was, like, Mrs. Susco, like, please just don't tell my mom that I'm in this this side of the library. It was, I grew up in a very small north in northeast Pennsylvania town so that keeping in that in mind there's like not a lot of diversity as well so a lot of the selection itself was not very diverse but I uh like saw the newest releases of romance novels and Inner Harbor which is the third book of Nora Roberts like Chesapeake Bay saga was on the shelf in paperback they had just gotten it in paperback so I was like, oh, pretty beach scene. And it looks like there's a mystery and a romance. So it must be okay. And my mind was blown, like right off the top of my head. <laughs> and I was like, I have no idea what physical gymnastics these adults are doing, but this seems like amazing stuff. And that was like the end of it for me. And so now 
all of my adult romances so far have been in trilogies with a group of friends and each of the books in the trilogy has been like a separate romance which is very much a like a structure that I learned from all of the norm of books that I inhaled in my youth and like that's that balance of slapstick comedy with like self-deprecation that I picked up from Jennifer Cruzy or Susan Elizabeth Phillips that's also like has made its way into my writing process and my writing style but then I started reading like I, I read my first diverse book when I was like that that actually like I could see myself in like my first South Asian diverse book when I was like 21 and I read Born Confused by the new the new Jedi Hidier and at that time I was like oh, I can do this like I've actually I had actually had people tell me before then like well if you're not seeing a lot of diverse people in the books that you're reading maybe that's a, for a reason and you should consider if you're writing you should consider that as the sign and I didn't understand what they were telling me like I'm like that makes no sense like this this just doesn't make sense and when I read the Nuja decide his hideous book born confused I was like yeah um this is the thing this is what I'm doing like I'm going to take all of this stuff that I learned from these people who basically developed the framework of the modern romance genre in the U.S. and I'm going to take my culture and my community and show people that we have a place in this structure and in this framework so that is like, that is part of the core story that has kind of shaped Nisha Sharma. I love that though. Cause I like, I love knowing that about, cause I could see exactly what you're saying, both of you. And for me, I think it's no surprise. So my first romance was, um, I had read, my mom read Romantic Suspense and I read Iris Johansson who wrote like romantic, it was mostly suspense with like some romance. And so I went into my library and I was like, well, she wrote, I like that book. I want to read more of her books. And I picked up The Magnificent Rogue, which I reread a couple of years ago. And I was like, maybe it's just scandalous because I was like 14. No, that book is scandalous. It is like the stuff he's doing with Heather. And I'm like, like at 14, I was like, <laughs> like what? And I, I promptly inhaled all of her historical romances. And they are all like just as bonkers, just as scorcher, like, like, and she sort of skirts the edge of that 80s thing because they came out in, like the late 90s. So like everybody's mm -hmm. technically legal, but there's like some sketchy behavior for sure. But so I started there and then wandered off from romance for a while. But like when I came back, I was in my like early 20s, like late teens, early 20s. And I had, you know, because it was urban fantasy was really hot at that point. And I read Shelley Lawrenston's Magnus Pack trilogy and I read Cressley Cole's Immortals After Dark and I was like you can do this like you're allowed to tell the like to have heroines like their heroines imprinted on me that they're so bonkers and so over the top and like you know unlikable and like bitchy and mean and vicious and like unapologetically like will stab someone and I was like I didn't like like I am not like that in real life but like fictionally that is my crack like and so they I mean you can tell that when you read my books that like I was like well if they can go that bonkers I can go that bonkers and maybe I can go a little more bonkers in like a non-paranormal way because my books aren't really paranormal but like they definitely um imprinted on me really intensely <laughs> which I think surprises nobody like when you you know if you're familiar with my stuff um oh my god katie do you remember those early historical romances like how bonkers they were see like, i don't know how much we can like actually talk about this stuff on like <laughs> a recorded zoom channel but like like there were, i remember the julie garwood books where they would be like riding a horse like like back to back and like <laughs> they'd just be together for like 17 pages on this horse <laughs> in one of those iris johansson books like she's like she's a horse girl essentially and like She's like, basically says like, do me like the horses do. And I like, I thought I hallucinated it. I was like, certainly that was not in that book. I found it and I read it and it, it was, it definitely a hundred percent was. I, but I actually missed a lot of like the like canon, like that people consider canon of romance in like the historical, because mm -hmm. up until I started reading romance 
intentionally the only historical romance I read was Iris Johansson because mm. I didn't like know that there were more like I thought that she was the only I don't know you know like because when you there was no internet or yeah. I mean I didn't have access to the internet um so I was like oh this is cool I, I don't think I even it didn't even occur to me to go into the romance section like <laughs> but like the the imprint of those early novels you, we can all see in the novels that are out today like oh absolutely like Ransom by Julie Garwood, for example, is like, who hurt you? And he goes like on a war path, right? And and we see that in like our modern contemporary mafia romances. Like who hurt you? <laughs> well, and like, is it, see, now I'm going to muck this up. Is it Lord of Scandals where she shoots him? Is that... No, yeah, where she, yeah, that... she puts on a murder dress. She changes her outfit into a red dress. And then she goes to where he's like just... hanging out with the men and just shoots him. Like I, I read that book a couple, like during the pandemic for the first time. And I was like, all right. Like, I, you know, I, I love a heroine that'll shoot a hero. Like that is, that is one of my id list items, which on that note, <laughs> what... Because, like, I collect idlist items ever since mm -hmm. I, like, learned of their existence. And I find it super helpful in writing and also in, like, reading. Um, what are some of your, like, instant, like, oh, crack, yeah, uh, items or places or people or, or character types that you gravitate towards, whether it's writing or reading? Go for it, Nisha. <laughs> oh, me? Yes. Do you, Aram, why don't you go first to give me a moment to think about it? I'm like pulling up my like Apple list of id stuff now. And I can go first yeah. too if you need time to. <laughs> you can go first just okay. because I don't know what that is. I'm okay, so uh, Jennifer Lynn Barnes gave this, I think it was an RWA talk years ago now. Yeah. And I say years ago, I have no idea how long ago it was. Time has no meaning. It's a flat circle. Um, but uh, it's basically this concept that all popular forms of media have pleasure points that they hit these particular pleasure points really hard like and you can look at any of them and it's like wealth or power or like whatever there's a list of them I don't have it handy but she's like but you can take that and niche it down further because each person has particular pleasure but like points or I, pleasure buttons sounds dirty but like you know pleasure points like for me it's like kidnapping as a love language I love a lady gang I love a heroine that will shoot a man I have a thing for bat like really expensive bathrooms i don't know it shows up in my books all the time um is there a greenhouse I i'll put a greenhouse in a book so fast and just like like amber colored eyes like it's just weird little things that like but the her whole thing is that if you write to that id list like unapologetically like i love this i'm putting this in my book one it can help you ease out of slumps in the book itself because you can be like okay well what can I put into it here to make it more interesting and two which is what I found you know 10 years into this career is that your readers that gravitate towards you and become like hardcore readers have very similar id lists and it becomes like a trust thing that they're like oh yeah I trust you to get me there because like your taste lines up with my taste and it can be this like really magical thing like when you're chasing that joy mm -hmm. of like the id list um, and so I have an actual like list too. I, it should be Me digital. Too. I should, I had to go track it down because I was putting together a mafia romance plan and I was like, I need my id list. Um, and the mafia is on the list because like, you know, I, I, I love, I love a character that'll just do up some murder for reasons. <laughs> they don't even gotta be good reasons. They can just be mo mediocre, but. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I ha also have organized crime on my id list. Uh, I also have Who Hurt You on my id list. I have, <laughs> I have billionaires, uh, <laughs> pregnancy trope or surprise pregnancy trope. I'm garbage uh, for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, instant, uh, instant, insta love on my list as well. Uh, I have folding flannel shirts up the forearm. <laughs> I have leaning in doorways. <laughs> um, I have clean and orderly condos. <laughs> For some reason, don't ask me. It's an idlist. 
Um, and uh, one of the other things I'll mention on here is like a black kurta, which is like for South Asians, it's like it's kind of like our version of a Henley. <laughs> that Henley, like I got there. You. We go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I put it the list. Like when I find something, I'm like, oh, I like that. Like. I love the miscommunication trope, but only when it's two idiots in love that are like, they could never like me. They're just saying that my dress is nice because they like the color red. It's like, and in his head or their head, it's like, oh my God, she's so beautiful. And like, I I, I, I didn't know I was garbage for that until I read T.K. T. Kingfisher's Paladin's Grace. And I was like, this, I love this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, all right, <laughs> hit us. <laughs> okay, um, so... I'm so sorry to spring this on you. I should have like sent an email. <laughs> Can you, we have to talk about this more. Um, I know. Uh, so you know what would be awesome if you if you're still thinking about it, you can always like tell people to sign up for your newsletter, and then you'll like post it there. <laughs> you should sign I mean, up this, that might be something I do anyway. Uh, <laughs> but no, it definitely uh, shit. Um, man, where are my readers at? Can some of my readers tell me what they are? I uh, mean, you love, you, you, I, that's a great <laughs> question. Sorry, all I'm thinking of is sing me to sleep and I'm like, monsters? Like, tail? I don't know. Well, I mean, yeah, I definitely do like a good rack of antlers. That's true. You're right. Um, but like. Whitney just, Harris says you love soft boys. Literally, yeah, literally soft only for you. Oh, I haven't been reading the chat. Soft yes. boys are good. They're always, they're good on, like, when they're soft on the inside, but, like, nobody else knows they're soft, you know. Um, but, yeah, I also, like, like, uh, like, you know, people who, who are messy and they get to be messy, which is definitely something that wasn't seeing me to sleep. Like, when you have, you know, depression or grief or whatever, and you don't have to be, like, you could just be angry, like you could just be mad and just be like absolutely insufferable uh, to everything and everyone around you. Uh, Ottomans, I do love a good Ottoman, a good Ottoman scene. Um, just like really good um, multi-use furniture is always is always just a good, you know, like the just like a like a sectional couch, um, you know, like an L-shaped desk. Something that's a little a little uh, more specific than the regular stuff, but you could do a lot with it, right? Um, but uh, definitely, like like more tropey use, like bodyguards, obviously, because it's like reluctant bodyguards are the best. Um, but also just like people who just like make decisions and like hey you guys just have to follow like you just do it uh, also what will always get me eat just for a second like it will be i like this is how marvel got me for a split second because i just really not a marvel guy but like hey i'm building a team like that's that thing where i'm just like yes you are building a team and i'm in absolutely let's go uh so like uh that and then like um Oh, actually, yeah, uh, like found family. So like relationships where they were, you know, they weren't related or they were related, but they didn't have like a, a parental figures or whatever. And you just had to take somebody under your wing. Um, and you're like, yeah, you're, you're my kid now. Congratulations. Which uh, obviously happens a lot in my books as well. Um, Aphrodite just every time she goes somewhere, comes home with a kid. Uh, she's now on three kids. So it's like, uh, it's that thing too. And I think that comes a lot from like, you know, being a, a queer kid and you kind of have to find your own community and your own people to fit in with. And uh, so that's really important to me is just like, where they, hey, you know, you need a dad? Congratulations, you're coming home with me. Like, let's go get some pizza and we can talk about it. You want your own room? Do you want a window with a view? which is also what Hades did and gave everybody a room uh, at his hotel. So it, it's stuff like that, I guess, but it's very much like love and affectionate and like 
just like things that you can use towards that. Um, and I'm sure there's like a million others, but yeah, I'm going to have to make a list. And then Please do. Cause I would love to see your list. Like at one point I attended a, like a small little writers thing and like a bunch of people share their it list. And I'm like, Oh yeah, that's on my list too. And it was so like, I just, it's like one of those like weird little like trivia things that makes me so happy because like, you yeah. don't know what might be on your list until you see somebody else's list. And then you're like, Oh yeah, that didn't even occur to me, but I love that shit. Yeah. Like, like trading cards. That's what it feels like. You know yeah, like, I mean? like, yeah. like the, like a, a hero whose hands shake when he touches his love interest, like the tremors, like, oh my God, it makes me weak. <laughs> so <laughs> like, just like random little, like, it's just, it's so great because Jennifer Lynn Barnes um, divides it up into like tropes, places, people, and things. And so it's just, it's, it's a really nice, um, yeah, Whitney, thank you. <laughs> uh, it's a really nice, like, it's very helpful like to like it's even when like putting together a story or just picking a book I want to read it's like oh yeah no I, I like I like that I will instantly buy that book and my new thing is baking shows mm. if there's a baking show am I gonna read 10 books on baking shows probably not but I'm gonna buy the shit out of them because I'm like oh I love a baking show <laughs> so uh Scars, also scars. Scars is a big, mm. big yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, and I, yeah, because most of my things, I think, in my in my thinking about making this list, is it's a lot of character stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of my, I think I hit a lot of my a list items in Hephaestus. Like if I had to look at a character where I was like, all of my best shit is going into you, bro. Like it would be him, one hundred percent. So yeah, he got the scars. Um, he got the the smirk and the uh, I hate everybody but you and oh yeah. uh, that's my favorite you know, mm -hmm. yeah the reluctant bodyguard the you know always you know teasing the hopeless romantic even though I'm the hopeless romantic so I wouldn't actually really like that but he was very much the you know pragmatic kind uh, you know your love isn't real and everything's gonna go to dirt but. And then falls in love and now he's like, you know, spoiler for book three, just like the most <laughs> loving, oh, romance? Like I eat that for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Like that's him now. So I think that's, that's like, he got all of the best traits, I think. And I love that in, in the interconnected series too, is seeing somebody who was so cranky and like, no, I don't do love or like whatever, or like the crusty right. exterior and seeing them so gone for their love interest, like in later books, like there's a scene in the third Dark Olympus book where um, Eros is out in the hallway doing something and like Helen's hair is kind of messed up and he's like, pulls out bobby pins and she's like, what the fuck are you? And he's like, well, sometimes Psyche's hair gets messed up and like, I keep a supply because like to help her out. And it's like, Sir, it's like, very this man. Like, this is very these are the men. Yeah, that's the character development you want. I don't care if you like are now a better person for everybody else. I just care if you carry a hair tie for your girl now when you walk down the street. That's it. That's all I care about. And What's also, the at the same time, you take your shirt off by like reaching over your shoulder. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't thought of that one but yeah okay. that's a good like I, I love it in movies I just never even occurred that mm, it's going on the list too yeah, that's, <laughs> like, you know, not something I can do personally so I don't think no listen I had to be cut out of a dress once because I could it just it's it's, it's clothing's hard okay clothing is challenging absolutely, anybody absolutely. that has the coordination to like pull that off I'm like you're instantly winning well done you congratulations <laughs> And I think it's time for questions. Are we, is that what's happening? Okay. Hello. Hello. Yes, let's do some questions. Okay, so we have a question here um, about the mentioned authors when we were talking about authors. So if you can remember what your author, who the authors were, I'm going to write them down as you speak. We have, I remember Maggie Stiefvater and then after that, I got lost. So we have Iris Johansson. Wonderful. Um, Julie Garwood, Nora Roberts, Cressley Cole. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Shelly Lawrenston. I guess I could. 
Ellie Lauren's done. Boop. Oh, I Wonderful. downloaded that pack trilogy, Katie, that you told me. And it is blowing my mind. It's so cracky because like, I mean, there's stuff in it that like didn't super age well. Like there's a little bit of like um, ableism and stuff, but it's so cracky because you can tell that she's just having the time of her life writing these crazy ass heroines that are like, <laughs> yeah, the FBI, I'm on the, like, whatever. I couldn't be on the computer for four years because of stuff or like, oh, it's all just the arson. We just, the arson's a little, we don't talk about the arson. Like I love it. Yes. Primo. <laughs> so we have a question from an anonymous attendee that says, Katie, I read major Sopranos vibes with the political landscape of Olympus. Can you talk about how you created the world? Are there elements you wanted to add to Olympus that didn't make it into either book? Um, I, you know, I, I kind of wish I'd, I, I didn't watch Sopranos. I, I don't like sad stuff or like stuff that like will traumatize the hell out of me. Um, Olympus is more like a grown-up Gossip Girl with, like, mob vibes. Like, if there was a little more murder on Gossip Girl when they were all adults. Um, it's just, I love the glitz and glamour and, like, awful people doing awful things, but also being kind of beholden to the people that they have power over because ultimately, like, and as the series progresses, this comes into play, but ultimately, like, they exist at the whims of the people of Olympus. Mm -hmm. And their power is kind of celebrity culture but it's also like can be taken away if they don't play the game and so I don't know if there was anything that because like the series is kind of unfolding slowly so like we established it in the first one started unfolding the second one so there's stuff that I'm excited to get to that we haven't seen yet but as far as how the world's built and like the characters that are in it and like the components of it it's definitely how I'd like it to be, I guess. <laughs> like I planned it out somewhat intentionally. Got a little chaotic. <laughs> so this is a question from Emily and we've kind of talked about this a little bit, um, but she wants to know what is it that draws us to these stories, these retellings again and again, do you think? Oh, all right, all right, go. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, uh, I'm like teacher. I know this is. I know the most. The most uncomfortable part is Katie. You start. <laughs> uh, I think. I think for me, it's just a lot of like they were so um, influential growing up. Like there was so much that revolved around them because, like, obviously you had all the Disney movies, and then you know. I remember in fourth grade, we had an entire, like, half a year where we just read different variations of Cinderella. Um, and it was like, you didn't even realize how many different, you know, because, like, every, every country has their own retelling. And then, um, you know, different people within the same country have their own retelling and different cultures have their own retelling. So um, I think it's always that thing of, like, the core is always there. Like you understand the core really well and it had some kind of impact on us at some stage in our lives. And the older you get, you learn more from them. Every time, you know, you look at it again, there's different lessons than when you were, you know, eight. And there were different lessons than when you were 18 and 28. And I think like having those kind of core ideas or messages still being relevant but obviously the world is changing um we're in a, in a different place than we were when they first came out um so we kind of want to see those evolve with us because you know they're they're what we were handed down and we want to hand them down to the next generation and that's i mean that's really what storytelling is but it's like these are the ones that you know were you know being handed down from the beginning. So it's kind of that thing of like, you want it to evolve with you. You want it to grow with you because, I mean, we can keep it the same, but a lot of that stuff isn't aging well, you know? So um, being able to bring it into a modern world and also make it so that it's marketable to more people, so that it means more to more people, um, which, you know, obviously is especially important to me because it, 
the whole point of me doing the retelling is, if, is so that my communities can see themselves in them so that they can feel involved and they can feel included and they don't have to, you know, feel left out. So, because, I mean, we all had to, you know, we all seen them, we all loved them. So why don't we get to see ourselves in the stuff that we love? So I think that that's, um, for me, what keeps drawing me back to them is just the fact that like, they're going to be there. Um, they're always going to be there. And, and we've, you know, everybody loved, because I mean, now they're, you know, you have the Beauty and the Beast trope or, you know, the Cinderella trope because now they're they're cemented into the literature. So it's just a matter of what you do with them now. And I think that they, they're so immortal. They, I mean, what else, are you, what else are you gonna do? You know what I mean? Like they're gonna be there. So you might as well kind of, you know, continue to evolve them because somebody has to. So um, yeah, I think it's just this, they're, they're not going away ever. Uh, whether that's like a like a a circular argument, the fact remains. Like even if we weren't going back to them, like they've already been so engraved and everything, we're not going to forget them. Like they're not going to be buried anytime soon. So, Nisha, I mean, I I don't think there's much more I can really add to to like what RM has said about retellings and reimaginations but I will say that like some of these stories have shaped the way that certain generations look at relationships at society at the way that they interact with each other at uh, their total belief systems like at one time like Fifty Shades of Grey on like outside of just like the romance bubble like was considered like you know erotic and like super hot and now we're getting people to like a place where there's like not they're not kink shaming they're not um they're more accepting and open about like their sexuality and um about a person's uh like right to pleasure and and that's like a story that has kind of shaped like a lot of minds uh, when it comes to, you know, the concepts that were in the story. But that was a retelling. And that was like a retelling, like, and that retelling also had like core components that were retellings from other stories. So, you know, this is like how story shapes ideas and generations, so. Yeah, and I feel like, yes to all that, yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, the only thing I'll add is that I think that by the nature of those stories is that they are reflections of the people in the societies telling them. And so it's good and right and the awesome that they are changing in like our, for us and for our like generation and our society and our like, we're bringing these modern uh, mentalities and to these ad adaptations that are changing some of the core or it's not changing the core foundation of it, but it's also bringing in different stories to this and allowing it to like evolve in a way that I think is really awesome and it makes me excited. Yeah, I love that. So Erica has a two-parter. The first part is for Nisha um, and it says, how is publishing YA um, different than publishing adult fiction? Um, so like a couple different things. Uh, the first is that when I sit down to tell a story, um, I don't really approach the process any differently. Um, I'm telling a story from a voice of a character of a certain age. Um, and so like the process remains the same. And that's usually like the first question that I get, like how, how is writing it different? But like the actual like industry itself or like what I'm trying to accomplish is a little different. So I was, uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have a really good friendship with Meg Cabot, who um, is the author of The Princess Diaries. And, and we were like texting the other day and we were talking about the difference between YA and adult. And I think we've kind of like boiled it down to like one very complicated statement. Um, and that is writing YA and like the, the actual like experience of telling a story for a certain age group feels like I'm trying to tell a love story of characters who are trying to figure out who they are and if 
that person um, has the ability to love and be loved by this other person. Um, meanwhile, writing adult romance feels like um, this person has a, a pretty decent understanding of who they are, but they have to be willing to change that perception in order to make room for uh, being loved or loving someone else. So, um, so that's kind of like <laughs> what we've narrowed it down to. I don't know if that answers your question, but... <laughs> Wow, that's a really good answer. <laughs> so the second part of Erica's question is for everyone. Um, and it says, do you allow your family to read the spicy scenes in your books? <laughs> my books are dedicated to my parents and neither of them know it because they haven't opened it. <laughs> I So I'm like estranged for most of my family so I don't really worry about it but um I did recently my eldest is 16 now and yesterday literally came home and was like oh I told the kids in drama class about your books and one of the kids picked up like electric idol and I'm like Katie you're gonna be called into a parent teacher conference I'm like well she's been telling people since like the beginning of time like she likes to like shock people like my mom writes like dirty books and it's always been like a whatever but like now I'm like wait um I'm like you can't no uh eh. like but I mean I like on one hand as a parent I'm like I don't I don't want to know that I do not need to know that anyone who's under 18 is even, nope don't need to know that but on the other hand, like I was reading adult romance at like 14. So like, it's, they're not my kids. It's not my business. My kids have a strict rule. I don't curtail their reading of like adult content or not adult, but you know what I mean? Like I, if they want to read adult romance, that's fine. They can't read my books till they're 18 just because like, I don't need the therapy bill. <laughs> like they can make the educated decision as adults should they want to later on. Um, and the only thing my husband reads in my books is the acknowledgments because he's not a big, he like audios, but he doesn't, he likes YA fantasy. He doesn't like, he doesn't want to listen to like boning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't talk to most of my family, but the ones I talk to, like they can if they want to, like, but you know, there's a lot, obviously too, is like, you know, we grew up in a very, I'm conservative Catholic family. So while I do not, uh, I'm not, hey, you guys should absolutely read this. No, no, I tell them like there's sex in it. Like you do what you want, but there's sex in it. Like I don't, I've passed the point of where I'm like scared because like coming out as trans dude after that, like y'all, I'm not scared to tell y'all anything. So it's just like um, handing it over to them. Uh, there was, uh, my nephew, who is uh, 15, he was very excited. And he was like, I saved up money. I want to buy your demon book. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. I legally cannot let you do that. Um, but I love you very much. <laughs> so you just keep that money and not do that. <laughs> um, so Ooh, that's that would open some horizons. Ever, yeah, that's the only one where I like had to actually say, no, you cannot do that. <laughs> um, but otherwise, like, yeah, if they want, like my sisters bought them, I don't think she's read them, but you know, they're there. Um, so if they want to, they can. And my siblings are all of age, except for a couple of them, but they definitely are not reading like that so yeah I, I just I don't really worry about it too much <laughs> my family is like super supportive they'll all buy the books like they'll all have the books like displayed on their shelves like my mom will send it in the whatsapp auntie chat group like oh like look what my daughter did like all of my aunties showed up for my book signing like all of them showed up like they bought samosas like it is like they're amazing <laughs> they aren't opening the book they're just gonna just keep it there and I'm okay with that so I never worry because I know they're not gonna be opening this book <laughs> that's the best for both worlds though it's like you're like yes I feel so loved and supported also I'm not traumatizing either of us so like that's great like my husband gets traumatized enough with me being like well so I think this dragon's gonna have two dongs and he's like what <laughs> I'm like, no, fine. Like, listen, like reptiles have it. And he's like, because like my TikToks sometimes show up on his for you page and that one did. And he's like, Katie, what the fuck is this? I'm like, no, <laughs> it's science. The reptiles, there's, there's a reason. And he's just like, I don't. 
but he, but he still does that but then he hand sells my books to like strangers on the street so like <laughs> it's good <laughs> oops okay well i love that that was very fun <laughs> So we are about at the end of our night. This one really flew by. So let's just take a quick second to talk about uh, what is on the horizon. What's the next thing from everyone that we should be looking out for? Nisha, I'll have you start. <laughs> uh, so Dating Dr. Dill comes out March uh, 15th of this year. Um, and pre-orders open now. You can get them at third place books. Um, and um, it's uh, it's going to be it's going to be great. I, I'm pretty sure it's going to be great. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay. Uh, well, I talked about mine a little bit earlier, but uh, the next book will be Let Me In, which is Gods of Hunger book three. Um, it's scheduled for February 14th. Um, you know, there's a pandemic and stuff going on, though it might get pushed back a tiny little bit, but February, March, um, is what we're shooting for. I will be going into edits next week. Um, and then, you know, later on in the year, there will be the, uh, Demon series, uh, Seven Deadly Sin series, which is a series of sacrilegious events. And it'll start with book one which is greed and charity. Um, and then I also have, like these are the ones I'm sure about, um, but you can find them all if you subscribe to Patreon or get on my newsletter or whatever. Uh, but uh, the next one will be uh, my mummy reimagining, which is basically the prequel story in the mummy movie of Imhotep and Anaxuna Moon um, with black people. Uh, so it's, uh, it'll be that, and that'll be a prequel to a series as well. Um, so those will be the next three things that come up on my docket. So I am so excited for that mummy book ever since you talked about it. I'm like, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna let you put it out in your time, but I'm, I'm gonna be there and waiting for it when it comes. <laughs> I mean, you will literally be there every morning. So yes. I'm like, yeah, well, at least then, you know, yes. um, and then, you know, we can, talk shop and I'll have to go through all the all the things that I because I'm I just when I started writing it I was like watching the mummy back to back to back to back three times four times five times so I'm just like yeah you got to keep uh the inspiration flowing so I was just doing that and playing uh Assassin's Creed Origins and nothing else so that's probably what I'll have to go back to as soon as I finish this book and I can move on to that one so that'll that's, be fun Perfect. that's amazing um <laughs> Let's see. What is next? Okay, so yeah, the next is actually the Dragon Book. It's the Dragon's Bride. It comes out uh, March 29th. It is a monster romance. It's a Beauty and the Beast retelling, kind of. And um, starts with a demon deal, ends with a whole lot of spice and, like, me going, did I go too far? I guess we'll find out together. Um, and then after that is the third Dark Olympus book, which is Wicked Beauty, which is Helen, Achilles, and Patroclus. No tragedy, just happily ever after, and happy endings <laughs> so uh, that's gonna be my tagline i need to write that down <laughs> uh, love it okay that sounds so good everyone i can't wait so i'm going to we're, we're kind of at the end of our evening so i'm gonna go ahead and relink the books of the night in chat so there you don't have to do any scrolling so those should be good to go. Audience members, thank you so much for joining us. This has been such an absolute joy. Um, if you would like to let us know what you thought of the event online or in person, we always, always, always love to hear from you. Authors, truly a joy. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been so much fun. Is there any last thing that you want to say before we say goodnight? Just thank you for having us. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> All righty. So I, with that, I'm going to say one more thank you. And it's time for the awkward waving to commence. So <laughs> good night, everyone. <laughs>